welcome back to the sixth gear garage. Today, I'm going to show how to install new or bottle drop spindles on a 1979 to 1983 Toyota pickup using newer suspension parts from later models. I'm also going to show you how to do a quick brake upgrade to one ton parts. I already pulled off the upper and lower control arms along with the knuckle and the brakes and hubs in a previous video, but set those aside and save them because there is some hardware I'm going to need to reuse. And over here, here's a quick rundown of what I have so far. This is the drop spindle. This is by Street Edge, which is pretty much a knockoff of the Belltech. And these are only available for 1984 to 95 pickups. They don't make one for the 79 to the 83 models. So to get these to work, what you have to do is upgrade the upper and lower control arms to 1984 to 1995 parts. Now I went with 1991 for the specific reason that if I ever wanted to, I could also use DJM lower control arms for more of a drop. But right now I just use stock replacement parts because I'm not sure how low I want to go. I also used upper and lower ball joints from a 1991 to match the uh, hole size on the control arms. Now farther back here, we have the original torsion bars from the 1980. I did have to slightly modify these lower control arms to work with these brackets from the 1980 because they're slightly longer. Here's one from an 84 to 88. Look, look at this here. It lines up perfectly with the holes in the control arm. The 1981 is about a half inch longer, and I thought if I grabbed some of these brackets from a 1984 to 88, which would match the 1991 control arm, I could simply slip this onto my 1980 torsion bar and have everything work together. However, I found out the hard way that the 1979 to 1983 trucks use a slightly smaller diameter torsion bar than the 1984 and up trucks. But what I do know is that this from 1984 does not fit this torsion bar. So I had to go back and uh, drill that extra hole, which I'll show as well today. And everything back here is all original. The uh, bolt here and the ganker, that's all 1980 parts. The mounting bracket here and the bushings, these are all from a 1991 as well. And these hubs, they need to be from a 1984 or newer. I used some that I had from a 1987 that I parted out. And of course, the wheel bearings need to match this hub. Then for the rotors and the calipers, these are both from a 1988 one-ton pickup. Nothing fancy like a Chinook, but just a plain one-ton non-dually rear pickup. And this setup is just a little bit bigger than the factory brakes, but it will allow me to retain the factory 14-inch wheels. And there is yet one more piece of the puzzle, and that is the strut rod. Uh, here's the original from the 1987 I parted out, and I needed this part of the rod because these holes fit this newer control arm from the 1991. Here is the original rod from the 1980, and these holes were a little bit too far apart. However, this bracket didn't fit the frame of the 1980, so here is my uh, repainted original bracket, and that's going to mount up here. And then once I get some new hardware and bushings for this rod, I'll be able to connect it to the lower control arm. So there's a quick rundown of all the parts needed to make this work. Now we're going to go around to the passenger side, and I'm going to show you exactly how to put it all together. Starting with replacing this 43-year-old uh, rubber bushing here with a brand new one. And this is also from the 1991. The first thing I like to do when removing these old bushings is to drill some holes through the rubber to weaken it and make it less dense. And then I do the same from the back side. And then I use a razor to cut the extra rubber that sticks out past the outer sleeve. Then that brings us to the next step, which is bushing fire. Heard it from the other side as well. So once it gets going on its own, just kind of let it burn and sizzle for a while. And once it goes out, give it a good whack with the hammer and all the burnt parts will fall off on the floor and I can start to burn more of the fresh unburnt rubber. And that process usually needs to be repeated a few times or more. 
I also went back to the drill and added more holes to help the fire burn into the surface faster. Eventually, the inner metal sleeve was able to be twisted out of the rubber bushing with a pair of vice grips. Now, with a big hole in the middle of the rubber, the fire can spread inside of the bushing and get plenty of air to keep the fire going. This black smoke is really nasty by the way, so now is the perfect time for a lunch break. And at this point, it should be able to scrape out. Oh, there it goes. And there's what's left of it. Next, grab a hacksaw and a blade. Put the blade through like this, then reattach it to the hacksaw. These old bushings have a metal outer sleeve that has to be removed before I can install the new bushing. I'm cutting a slit in the sleeve to create a gap that will allow the sleeve to compress slightly, which makes it a lot easier to remove from the frame. When cutting the slit, it's important to be consistent and cut in the same place every time. If I'm moving the blade up and down a lot, I'll just be scraping up the surface of the sleeve. Once I have a groove started, it's a lot easier to keep the blade in that groove and focus the cutting in one line. I'm also cutting the groove on the front flange of the sleeve. Now I'm using a hammer and chisel to get between the flange and the frame to see if I can get the sleeve to budge at all. And it didn't move at all with some taps from a hammer and a socket. So it was back to the hacksaw. Finally, I used a long bolt from a bearing puller along with a couple of wheel bearing races clamped together and a three quarter inch pipe joint to pull the bushing sleeve through the front of the frame. Once it was started, hitting the pipe joint with the BFH was enough to keep moving the sleeve through the frame. Once the pipe joint bottomed out, I used a deep socket of the same diameter to keep pushing the sleeve through with the force of the hammer. Now, this is the one I just did. And you can see I actually didn't quite cut through the outside edge. So I needed to cut a little bit more and that would have made it a lot easier. Here's the one I did on the driver's side previously, and you can see I cut all the way through this one, actually a little bit too far, and uh, into the edge of the frame where the sleeve sits. So because I was trying to be careful not to cut too far, I ended up cutting not enough. But when there is a slit going all the way through this outer sleeve, you can see it does sort of compress a little bit, and that reduces the overall diameter and allows it to come out a lot easier. So really you have to find whatever you have laying around to make this work. I just happened to buy this uh, bearing press kit for my Honda. I used the main uh, driver here from that and uh, just a fitting to go over the front of the hole there. And then I clamped a couple of old wheel bearing races together. That was a bigger diameter than the hole here. So that sat nice and flush against the frame there. And then that allowed me to have some room to actually pull this sleeve into. And then once I pulled it far enough to where it was kind of bottoming out on this here, I took this off and uh, used this three quarter inch galvanized coupler. And then I pulled it through farther with that. And uh, then eventually once it got in far enough, I just set it inside the hole and hit it with the hammer. And once I got past the depth of this, I use this uh, one and one eighth inch socket to hammer the rest of the way out. Now I'm going to clean out the hole, get any metal shavings or dirt removed, anything that's going to reduce the overall diameter and make it a tighter tolerance. And I'm going to slather it up with some anti-seize. We all know things shrink just a little bit when they're cold. So I'm gonna to toss this bushing in the freezer for a couple hours. All right, here is one very frozen bushing. Let me give it some taps with the hammer here. Now I've tapped it here just to get it started. And that is actually being absorbed by this rubber bushing. What I actually need to do when I'm giving it a lot of force is tap on this outer ring here and that will move the whole thing in. Keep in mind, as I'm working here, this is warming up and ever so slightly expanding because it's been frozen. So I kind of need to get a move on here. So I have this uh, old wheel bearing brace. 
giant washer on top. That one's gonna hurt. Within seconds, it's already there. Okay, this bolt is just long enough to make it through. I can't even put a washer on the end here, which I would like to do because I can't get enough threads through the back then. So I'm gonna just get it started, and then I'm gonna throw that washer on the other end once I get it pulled through a little bit. So here's how the back looks. I got a couple threads in that nut there. I'm gonna take this bolt out now so I get a washer on this end so I don't chew up the end of the metal sleeve and the bushing. Got washer on here. And there's probably some special tool to do this that I don't have. If I had the right tool, I probably wouldn't have this giant blood blister on my finger. Time to speed things up. Because the grease I applied earlier is being pushed back as the sleeve moves inward, I added some oil to the outside of the sleeve to keep it sliding smoothly. And that's about as far as it's going like this. All the pressure I'm putting on this bushing is on the center sleeve. And that's surrounded by flexible rubber which can prevent a lot of the force from transferring to the outer sleeve. Getting it started that way gave me some more threads in the bolt to work with. So now I'm gonna reconfigure this to press on the outer sleeve since that's what I need to be pulling through. Here's that bearing race again. And now a larger washer to cover up the edge of the bearing race. And then my bolt with the smaller washer there. And you can see I still have enough thread poking through the back now. Or I can use this bracket, which is getting pretty chewed up, by the way. Try and get a little bit more life out of this bracket. And I'm using this smaller bolt because, unfortunately, uh, the larger one I was using earlier, which is meant for this, this is too big of a diameter to fit through the inside metal sleeve on the bushing. So this is no longer an option. What's happening here is there's so much torque on this bolt nut right now that is actually sucking in the skinny washer and the fat bigger washer behind it. And I almost have no surface to grab onto because it's actually sinking in. And that's causing me to slip, which is gonna round off this bolt. I re-flattened the big washer in a vise and switched to the beefier torsion bar bolt and let the big hammer do some work. That definitely worked, but I'm nervous about fitting this head too many times and having to mushroom out and having these splines not fit. So here's another bolt that means nothing to me. And after a couple more minutes of smashing the bolt with the BFH, the bushing sleeve was almost all the way seated in the frame. Then I used the same bearing races I'd used before on the front side to pull the old sleeve out. Except now I'm using them on the back side to pull the new sleeve all the way in. And it's in. And that's how to install a bushing in the frame with just regular tools and things you have laying around. So let's unbolt this guy here. Next, I clean up the surface rust on that torsion bracket. Now it's time to modify the lower control arm to work with the 1980 torsion bar brackets. I'm to drill two holes, one right about here and one right about here. Let's figure out where the hole needs to be. Just 
gonna bolt this in place. And it's not gonna be super tight, it might have a little bit of play. You can see there, a little bit of play. But what I'm gonna do is just put it right in the middle. There, push it down a little bit harder now. And there. So right in the middle of the deeper part that I scratched is right about there. Drop the oil. Take this back apart, flip it around, and do the same for the other side. Now, because the original hole from the factory was reinforced, and then if you can see inside there, there's actually a metal tube that goes through their center so that when you torque it down, it doesn't squeeze these sides in a little bit. Just to ensure that the new hole is just as strong, I have a uh, steel pipe that I cut here. To figure the length of the pipe, I slid the bolt through the bracket into the newly drilled holes. Then I marked on the bolt where it met the inside edges of the control arm. Now I knew the length I needed to cut the tube. I transferred that measurement onto the steel tube, which I found at Ace Hardware after looking at every parts store in town. Cut it, and finally cleaned up the edges. And this fits my bolt, and I'm gonna jam that in here and get it lined up with the two new holes. And this is actually a really tight fit. Not even close on this side. So we're good over here. Drop that in so that won't move on me. And not even close over here. Almost lined up. And we're good. Then I reinstalled the bracket on the back of the lower control arm. But little did I know, I'd be taking it all apart again in a few minutes because I forgot to install the bump stop first. Now back over at the frame, pull this bolt back out, slide the LCA over my brand new bushing. This goes in through the back. There we go. Get the splines lined up. And then around front, washer, lock washer, and nut. And I forgot to get the bump stop from the old lower control arm and put it on the new one. Not only did I have to remove the long bolt and the steel tube that I finally positioned inside of the control arm in order to install the bump stop, but one of the two bolts for the bump stop was too close to the original bracing on the inside of the control arm, and there wasn't enough room to fit a socket over the nut to tighten it. So I ended up removing the entire control arm to see what was going on and ended up tightening that nut through the open end of the LCA with a crescent wrench. Then putting the steel tube back inside, followed by the long bolt. Now for the upper control arms. And they sit over here like that. And then here's the bag of the original hardware. Got the bolts. And then these are all the alignment shims. These will come later on once I need to adjust the uh, camber once it's all together. And these guys are 17 millimeter. I'll torque everything down once it's all together. Now for the upper ball joint. From the factory, the upper ball joint used to mount under the control arm like this. However, I'm gonna be doing the ball joint flip and mounting it on top of the control arm like this. And the reason for doing this is that you'll gain that extra, maybe what, quarter to a half inch um, of lowering height having it sitting on top like this. And then 
pull off the castle nut. Save that for in a minute. And let's head down here to the lower ball joint. And both the upper and lower ball joint are from a 1991 model year to match the upper and lower control arms. Now it's time for the knuckle, which was really the whole purpose of rebuilding this whole front end. And yeah, the big one should go on the bottom here. And the shorter one goes on the upper ball joint. And the cotter pins, I'm just gonna leave out for right now in case I do have to end up taking this apart again for some reason. Here is the rotor from the 1988 one-ton pickup. First, so this is from the 1987, the one I used the hubs from. And you can see it's overall about a half inch bigger and about 3 16 inch uh, thicker as well. And here is the hub from my 1987 two-wheel drive pickup. I already uh, took this apart, cleaned it, installed new races and bearings and a new seal on the back. How to replace wheel bearings in two minutes. First, I removed the outer bearing then the seal on the back, then wiped out most of the excess grease. Next, I'm using a brass drift through the front of the hub to tap the inner bearing erase through the back. Then I flipped the hub over and went through the back to tap out the outer bearing erase through the front. Then I cleaned out more of the old grease. Next, I opened the new wheel bearings and took out the races and put them in the freezer for a bit to make them contract slightly. Then I removed the five 14 millimeter bolts that attached the hub to the rotor. They came right out because I soaked them in PV Blaster for about a week. You can see the rotor and the hub were still pretty rusted together and needed a beating to come apart. Next, I took the hub to the wire wheel to clean up some of the surface rust. Then I cleaned it out with more Duplicolor Prep Spray, which is the best thing i found to cut old bearing grease, even Molly Lube. And then washed out the Prep Spray with some brake cleaner. I put some grease on the clean surface for the outer bearing race, and used the brass drift to tap it in with the old race, and then tap the old race back out. Then I did the exact same thing for the inner bearing race. Brass drift is important here because the soft brass won't damage the hub surface or the bearing race. Next, I put fresh grease in the hub and on the races. Then packed both bearings with the grease using the palm of my hand until the grease was starting to ooze out the other side. I go over all this in full detail in another video. I'll put the link in the description. I greased the seal and tapped it in place using the old race. And packed the outer wheel bearing and dropped it in the outer race. And now it's time to bolt the 1987 hub to the new 1988 one-ton disc brake. Now it's time to put the hub and rotor onto the spindle. So first make sure it's nice and clean. And I've got some grease here. Just gonna throw a little bit on there so it's not dry. And you want to make sure that there's a little bit of grease on the back side here, which I can see there is actually plenty already. And the outside bearing uh, is actually over on the workbench. It fell out when I picked this up. So I don't have to worry about the spindle pushing that back out. Go get that all the way on there. There you are. Get back in there. A little bit more grease on the outside of the bearing here. Next, thrush washer. It goes in the uh, groove here on the spindle, just like that. Then comes the nut, and this is uh, 30 millimeters, and it gets torqued to 25 foot-pounds. Now I like to torque it, and then uh, give it a few rotations see how it feels and then check the torque again because usually you'll get a little bit more out of it once those bearings turn a little bit 
One more time. We'll do one more since it turned again quite a bit. Because if you think about it, you're really compressing all these bearings into the races for the very first time since they're brand new. These were bearings that were previously in the hub that have been used. I probably wouldn't need to retort this a few times. Then comes the cap and the cap needs to line up with this hole here in the end of the spindle. That's not right. That should do. This one's actually better because it lines up on both sides. I had a pair of needle nose. I'll just bend this by hand. Then I like to slap a little bit of just uh, regular bearing grease here. Doesn't need to be the high temperature red stuff. Slap some of that on there. Around the outside of that nut. And on goes the cap. Now it's time to install the brake pads onto the 1988 one ton pickup calipers. I did this in time lapse mode because it always takes me longer than it should to figure out the orientation of the clips and get the pads to squeeze into place. Then I usually end up having to reinstall one of the pads because I pushed it out or I had a clip wrong. I don't know how I can rebuild a vehicle, but brake pads are always a puzzle to me. And I install them onto the drop spindle using the 17 millimeter caliper bolts from the 1987. And the last piece of the puzzle for the front suspension is the torsion bar. So you can see the line here that I used to mark to make sure everything gets back in the exact same place it was originally. So I wanna make sure that everything lines up. I did clean this one on the uh, wire wheels, so the markers are gone off that, but I did put a little scratch in there to make sure I can get everything back in the right place. And pop this rubber boot back over this lip, and we're good. Everything's back the way it was. Now later on, once the truck is on the ground, lower back together, I will be adjusting these torsion bars to fine tune the ride height, and I'll show how to rekey them as well. And now I need to reinstall the anchor bolt so set this aside for now, set that aside for now. And there's a cutout in the bottom of the anchor here. And this piece here at the bottom of the bolt sits flush in there like that. And this one goes on top. And there's a, one side of this nut is slightly more flat than the other side. The flat side will go down. And there we go. And the last thing I was gonna do today was install these strut rods. However, I received the Prothane bushings to replace these old rubber ones, and they weren't even close to being the right size. So I'm working with Prothane to figure out what went wrong there. So I'll be installing these in the next video when I do the steering. And then I'll be installing the rear suspension, which uses lowering leafs and mini notches. And then I'll finally have a rolling chassis. And then I can pull the drivetrain from the rusty truck and put it onto the frame. Thanks for watching.